Delighted to say that Sharon Davis is uh, with me here through until nine o'clock tonight. Unfair Play, The Battle for Women's Sport is the book. And it's, uh, well, I think it's a must for every family, basically, to read and sort out. But take this. I, I've heard Sharon many times, quite rightly, talk when asked about, you know, what would you say to an aspiring young uh, sports woman who is trying to do... Uh, or achieve the sort of thing that you did. And I always remember you saying, you know, think of the long game. That was very much part of this. But just to put this into context with um, what might happen now as did happen before, Sharon, would be to say, you know, think of the long game. And suddenly you come up against Heidi Krieger, East German, who is taking at that stage... Yeah. For her, 2,600 milligrams of male steroids. A thousand more than Ben Johnson yeah. took when cheating to win in Seoul uh, back in, 19, uh, in the 1980s. Krieger then underwent sex realignment at the age of 31. I mean, this is just... Yeah, well, and, it, and it's Mark, just you disgusting. Know, it is disgusting, but... What's disgusting is that the IOC did nothing, and that's what what I've written very strongly in the book, yeah. you know. And Craig Lord, who co-wrote it with me, who writes for The Times, his partner was one of those women that was experimented on. Uh, and the way that those young girls were treated yeah. was literally as lab rats. And they knew that they could do this to the girls. They knew that they could give the girls these terrible, you know, testosterone, steranable, awful steroids that would make a massive difference and that they could take a very average swimmer and they could make them a world champion or a very average track athlete or a rower. Those are the three sports that they really concentrated on. And during that period of time, um, at, e at European level, can you believe the East German women won 92% of all the medals and practically none of the men's. And yet the governing bodies went, oh, that's not unusual, is it? <laughs> I mean, you know, you couldn't write this as to how stupid this was and how it was just ignored for so long. Mm -hmm. And many of these girls have had huge health problems, um, disabled kids, you know, several have died. I mean, it's it's an absolute travesty what was allowed to go on. So we've got this material. We know that giving these young girls this testosterone, how dominant they were. Um, my Olympic Games, they won six podiums. Yeah. You know, one, two, threes. We had um, British athletes that were fourth that no one's ever heard of that would have been Olympic champions and their whole lives would have been different. So, you know, again, this was what I didn't want to happen again. I wanted to make sure that even if it cost me dearly personally, it was worth it because I couldn't, I just couldn't stand by and watch another generation of young and, girls uh, uh, deal with this. And the IOC be allowed to be so negligent that they just did not care. You know, that was also well, something I felt strongly about. You know, again, and it reminded me of the, where, where you write in the book about the Olympic Charter from 1996 again here. what That's all very well, and they'll, they'll be brave about things, but you and I both know, and again, as you put in the book here, that individual Olympic committees and an Olympic committee as a whole, if they want to change their minds on certain things, they do. They'll, they'll say, we agree, and then when it's not working for them, they'll change it on the quiet. Yeah, absolutely. And they don't poll, you know, athletes, they don't poll coaches, no. they don't poll countries. They literally decide for themselves, and it's usually a commercial decision. I mean, the money that comes back from the IOC to the athletes is absolutely minuscule. It's, it's disgusting, really, and that was another thing I wanted to expose in the book, was mm -hmm. how commercially the IOC runs their business and it's not run for the athletes you know and, and that's what the athletes should be centric to this they should be the the main reason that they're holding an Olympic Games um yeah I mean it, 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 it was, you know horrendous things I thought I knew quite a lot and actually whilst we were doing all the research for the book we found out for example that the East Germans had put a, an abortion clinic in the middle of their training venue because the drugs that they were giving the girls were making them much more sexually active, you know, vast quantities of testosterone. Yeah. And then many of them were getting pregnant, not from other swimmers, but from physios and coaches and management staff and from security. And because they didn't want that getting out and, and into the general populace, they literally had an abortion clinic inside the training venue. Yeah. And you know, I mean... It's barbaric. It, it, it really was. And the IOC had many people defected, either with the pills or these stories. And again, over and over and over again, as we show in the book, they did nothing repeatedly. 
And yet we can come right up to date. And uh, before we talk about Will Thomas, who it was, but Leah Thomas after the transition, of course, um, Keir Starmer today, uh, well, mistiming for him, I think, in many ways. He's on social media put out this thing about how the football is the big thing for him, the 90 minutes, the way he plays it. He does this, he does that. He wants to encourage inclusivity for all the future and everything. And yet, here is the man running the Labour Party, the man who wants to be the next Prime Minister, who struggles, actually, to say what a woman actually is. No, we had a big breakthrough this week, though, didn't we? You we know, did. we we had a big breakthrough this week where he actually decided that a woman is an adult human female and that words should matter. Otherwise, we don't have ways to be able to describe ourselves. You know, and there's nothing wrong with a trans woman being called a trans woman. And that also describes exactly what that person is, too. But they are someone who's transitioned. So, you know, it's really important that we understand this. And it's really important that we have... Um, you know, that we are caring and that we are a decent society and that people are safe you know that's that's also but what we also understand is that women have fought for safe spaces and equal opportunities in sport for decades yeah, exactly you know and so for us to lose them literally overnight mm -hmm. we're now clawing it back um, and when that should have never happened the governing body should have been protecting us but they literally rolled over mm -hmm. you know instantly and threw all away all the things that we've worked so darn hard for and you mentioned leah i mean at the conference recently in Denver, I was angry, you know, most of the time. And I like anger because anger makes me do things. So that's yeah, fine. Me too. But the only time <laughs> the only time that I actually got tearful was when they had four young girls who were forced to share the changing room for months with Leah Thomas. Now, Leah Thomas, you say transition, but Leah Thomas hasn't transitioned anything. Okay. <laughs> Leah Thomas has just grown their hair and decided to call themselves Leah Thomas. Yeah. And Leah Thomas is a fully fledged male with male genitalia six foot four, who still professes to like females. And these girls were forced to change next to Leah Thomas every day, twice a day, for nearly two years. And when they said that they had a problem with it, they were sent to psychiatrists. And when they said they had a problem en masse, they were told that they would all be blacklisted, they'd lose their position on the squad, on the team, and they would potentially never get a job. Mm. Now, in my eyes, this is abuse. Yeah. These were young girls that were forced to get naked next to a male who was enjoying the process. Mm. I, That's not right. No, it's just not right. Well, of course it's not right. And, of course, the other the part, again, where the book helps us to understand more of that, by, of that particular case by saying as well, you know, as a man, he wouldn't have made the top 10,000 performances in, no. in the world at 400 metres free. I mean, this no, shows I mean, and that but, diving photo should be up there for everybody to see. I know, and that shows that explosive power that he was able to get so much further out. Mm. You know, his technique was really poor, but his no. explosive power was there, you know. So the more explosive an event is, throwing, jumping, versus middle distance running or long distance swimming or something like that, you know, the more explosive an event is, the bigger advantage to being male. Sure. Um, so... Yes, I mean, you're right. You know, we we have we bandied around this figure of, I think it was 465th yeah. from, you know, in the America, in, in the men's races to being first in the women's races. But that was just in in America. Yeah. So if you included the rest of the world, like you said, he, he's not even in the first two or three thousand. You know, and he went from being that poor to beating three Olympic silver medalists in the space of a year. I think one of the other things, and just coming back to Keir Starmer here now as well, and I'm, uh, I know that you will, but I'm going to keep him honest about this at any stage I possibly can too, that I don't want this to be part of his vote-winning uh, context and then suddenly not change it but not go on about it quite so much after uh, whatever happens after the next election because with all of this, it, what is a woman? We know what a woman is. We don't need to answer that question, do we, no. Sharon? So I think what we really must do, and what I would urge anybody who's watching to do, is get off the fence, find <laughs> your voice, all right? Because we are now being allowed to have a voice an awful lot more than we have done for the last few years, and it's being frowned on an awful lot less. So that fear factor is slightly less, which is great. But I think it's about 
being able to clarify the Equality Act of 2010. Now, when it was written, they used the word sex, and everybody knew when the word sex was used exactly what it meant. It meant biological sex, but that's been hijacked now, particularly by Stonewall, who'd managed to misrepresent the law continually, and people have not pushed back. Um, so what we absolutely need to do is we need to tell our MPs that they must clarify that Equality Act. Just premise the word sex to biological sex so that we have some process, some legal process of sex discrimination in this country that's based on biological sex. And, mm -hmm. you know, that that's for all of us. Um, it, 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 there's absolutely no reason why we can't have men's changing rooms and ladies' changing rooms and mixed changing rooms for anyone that wants to go into those changing rooms, whatever your sex is, you know. But obviously then that gives someone that's, that's transgender mm -hmm. someone to be able to change as well without mm -hmm. making young females feel very, very intimidated and, and very scared, which is exactly what was happening to those young girls in America. And one or two of the other things, and I want to really use what you've done and what you've said and, and, and how important this, this is. I'm, you know, my late father was a PE teacher and he understood uh, an awful lot of all of this. But uh, and when he taught in, in a mixed school, uh, something that you mentioned in the book here, he found that, you know, physical ability in performance might mean that you're a bit fatter than you would otherwise be if you are just trying to look right, if, if you know what I mean. That you've got to sort of measure this all up, that sport is aspirational, but we don't see it so unless that person looks absolutely tight and gorgeous. And that, that's yeah. the problem. Absolutely. I think that's one of the problems with losing sport on terrestrial television. So some sports have grown, women's football, women's rugby, women's cricket to a degree. And the ECB is one of the very worst offenders at the moment in the, in the UK. You know, they believe in self-ID. <laughs> so any male can self-ID into a women's team and throw a ball at a female at the moment, which yeah. is outrageous, right? It's dangerous, um, which, is, which is absolutely crazy. So I think it's 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 back to understanding the, the sort of biology, but it's also back to understanding that you can't be it if you can't see it. Do you remember the days of World of Sport and Grandstand on a Saturday afternoon? Absolutely. Which love watching, okay. And that was this wonderful opportunity, a showcase to be able to put so many different sports out there. And we would see some swimming, we'd see some badminton, we'd see some rowing, we'd see some cycling, you know, we'd see lots of different things. Not every little girl or every little boy can be a rugby player, a footballer, or a cricketer, right? A lot of them will want to do other sports, but if they're not going to see it, it's not going to inspire them. So it's really important that as the British Broadcasting Corporation that's supposed to be working for society, that they actually understand that that's their job to showcase lots of sports, not just the sports that come with the big money tags all the time. Yeah. And, you know, and again, it's a vicious circle. If you don't show it, it can't grow. Yeah. Um, in my day, swimming was on television probably four or five times a year. And now we're lucky if we get it on TV once. And, you know, I'd like to think as well that you read this book and you can close it and think, men stronger than women, that's not a stereotype. It's a scientific fact. But sex, age, weight and ability has to be identified for both sexes. And there are only two. Yeah, and, and you can't change it. Right. You know, that's the thing which is also extremely important that we explain to young people because we're lying to them at the moment. We're telling young children that have mental health issues, you know, whether that's genuine gender dysphoria or whether that's because they're in a really unhappy place and they think by changing their gender it's going to make all their problems go away, which it won't. Mm -hmm. um, we're telling them that they can change sex. And the chromosomes that are in your body will remain the chromosomes forever. And all that you will have to do for the whole of your life is to use cross-sex hormones and fight your natural body's urge to be what it is naturally. Yes. So, you know, this is not something to be taken lightly. And it's really important for kids to understand. And when we say to children, you're not old enough to smoke, to drink, to get married, to have a tattoo, to vote, that's because we believe that they don't have that cognitive understanding at the moment to make a massive decision which will be so life-changing mm -hmm. and yet we're saying to young people that you can decide to be the opposite gender and become sterilized mm -hmm. you know that's what puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones do 
and it's really important. And, and again, you know, the UK and parts of Europe are leading, but mm -hmm. Canada and America, I mean, goodness, Canada is in an absolute shambles, <laughs> it really is. I mean, I feel so sorry for the my counterparts in Canada at the moment. You know, yeah. they literally are running into a brick wall. Yeah, I, I understand all of that. Look, keep that voice going. Um, <laughs> it sounded brilliant. Uh, Keep coming back and telling us more whenever you want yeah, to. There is my book. And th the book has been fantastic. Unfair Play, Sharon Davis with Craig Lord, The Battle for Women's Sport. It's just a must read so that you, you understand and get it.